Right, let's get going. Sorry about the technical delays and faults. The, we haven't resolved them. Videos sort of don't work. So I'm just gonna have to come out of this and play the videos in line. It's not great, but apologies, that's all we've got. God, the acoustics in here are pretty good, aren't they? Hello, that's pretty, I like that. Okay, so moving on. Awesome artwork, check out the guy's Facebook page if you like it for more. Okay, bit about me before we start. Oh, I'm not used to seeing this so big. So I have been a C-sharp developer for something like 15 years or so. Uh, started off working for the AKI group, which was developing little mobile systems for um, council bus services, which was terrific. I got to go for a walk to test the tracking application and like walk around the hills a little bit, come back and it was work. Yeah. Uh, Cap Gemini worked on the Aspire contract. That means I work for the folks that made sure that your taxes are paid. I'm sorry. The works, that's the book place, Proto Labs, US company. Uh, believe it or not, very keen on te modern tech, very great place to work. European Scientific just left there so that I'm now one of those contractors that your mum always warned you about. Yeah, freedom. So, moving on. The great dilemma of our time. Two gents here. One is straight-laced and ordinary and boring, the other a slacker. But of these two men, which of them got to ride around in a flying time machine and almost sleep with his own mum? I mean, who do we want to be like? <laughs> okay, maybe not the last one, that's kind of weird. But that aside, flying time machine, yes. So, where can we save time? I'm assuming we as developers, I'm assuming we're all developers. If we're not, pay attention, pass this on to whomever it is appropriate to talk to. But the standard stages of a project. So as developers, which of these phases can we use to save ourselves some time, to save ourselves some effort? Because we want to slack like the gentleman on the previous slide. We want to stop wasting our time and spend it more on stuff that's worth doing. So. Gathering requirements, that's, your, that's like your business analyst. Designing a solution, probably your architect, bitter yourself as well. Coding, well that's us, yay. Testing, not really us necessarily, that's your testers. And enhancements, that will be us again. And of these two though, which is the one that your project is gonna spend like 99% of its life in? Well that's enhancements. That is where you're gonna spend most of your time, by a long way. How much actual greenfield development do we do? Not very much. How much would we like to do? An awful lot more. So the way we do that is to try and cut down on the amount of time we spend on enhancements by making a code base that is easy to enhance so that we can spend our time more productively. I, I don't know, eating pot noodles, reading technical books, whatever. So what are the reasons for delays? What is the thing that causes us to waste the most time when we're doing enhancements? Unclear requirements. Well, not a lot we can do about that. That is between you and whichever business analyst you believe in. We've got project management issues. Once again, that's from up high. But legacy code base, we can do something about that. That is a huge cause, cause of delay. And why is it a cause of delay? Because I can't understand what the heck it does. I mean, who here has ever had to work with a code base that's upwards of 15 years old? Yeah, of course we do. Yeah, and those things are nasty, ain't they? We got code where we don't know what it does. We got functions that once we do know what they do, they actually do about 18 different jobs all at once for some reason. It's a mess, it's horrible. Half of the job can actually be, where do I even make my change? What do these functions do? What is the purpose of all of this? This is tough, and this is a massive waste of our time. When, if we could clean this stuff up, it wouldn't happen. We could have a bit more fun. So, the standard pieces of a function. So I'm going right down to the basics. I'm going down to the functional level to try and save ourselves some time. These are the four pieces of a function as I understand it. You've got your parameters, that's what's coming in. You got your return value, that's what's coming out. And in between it, we got two ideas. We've got the business logic. The business logic being, what does the business want? If you were to ask a member of the business what this does, that's what you'd say to them, this is what it does. And then you've got the code structure, which is like you know, loop around and do a thing, select a thing. That's the sort of the really low level that your business don't care about. That is the how, the business logic, is the what. And 
I would argue that an awful lot of our problems come from the fact that these two end up being inextricably linked to the point that you can't really tell one from the other and they get in each other's way and make it very hard to understand what we're doing. So what I'm aiming to do is to unlink them, to take the structure away and just leave business logic. That's the aim. So, oh, I'm really not used to having to crane up to see this thing. Oh my gosh. Right, okay. So this is a good old fashioned bit of code. This is the sort of thing I deal with on an almost daily basis. So what is this even trying to accomplish? Uh, but a lot of us will probably get through this fairly quickly because this is the sort of rubbish we've had to deal with for like the last however many decades of our careers. New guys are gonna struggle in this because they haven't quite gotten into that mindset of this is what dreadful code looks like yet. But here we have it. We've got business logic mixed all over the place. We've got bits of structure, which we're doing all sorts of stuff that doesn't really need to be there. When we could make all of this on just a couple of lines of code really easily. And it wouldn't, but I almost no one ever seems to. Don't get it. But anyway, what is this doing? It's getting some data, doing a bit of averaging, and then transmitting it on. And if there's no data, then yeah. It's, I mean, this is totally fake. This ain't anything real. It's just an example. But let's imagine. This is what the customer have asked for. They've said, go through this data set, make an average of the prop ones, whatever the heck that represents. I don't really care. And then send it on to wherever. Again, I don't really care. So we do some, let's do some unit testing. We'll do a positive test. There we go. Very good. Very good. Now we'll do some negative testing. That is, we've got no data. Test coverage looks like this. Hey. And then we'll do an error, uh, brilliant. Now, this has got like 100% unit test coverage. We're laughing, ain't we? This is good. But then, you're looking down at your coffee cup and like a scene at a Jurassic Park, there's a ripple. You crane your neck up, it's the boss. You're awfully tall. And he wants something new. Prop two now. Great. Well, that's easy, except that the video don't work. Just a second. So what do we do? Apologies for the slightly rubbishy video. There we go. Jobs are good and right. Yeah. Easy. Look at all the time we've just saved. <laughs> but here's a question. What's the unit test coverage of that? Anyone? Zero. We have actually just duplicated all of that code. It's the same bloody code with like three changes in it, but the unit test level of coverage is nothing. So we can't trust it any more than we could trust the original function before we stuck the unit tests in. Rubbish. So starting on some fairly, this is starting on some fairly basic examples. So we could make this a donut function. Oh, I can see the notes and everything. This is terrible. Oh dear, okie dokie, just ignore the notes. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Right, a donut function. This is, we're gonna cut a hole in the middle of this and we're just gonna let the outside world stuff whatever the heck they like in the middle to some extent. So how would I change this? Mm -hmm. There we go. So we'll just make this public into a private. We'll make it this an average of just whatever you like and then we use funks, good old funks. I love funks. If you're not using funks more, you're doing it wrong. Do we all know what funks are doing? Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Right, so that's it. Jobs are good. So now we can write as many flipping functions as we like for as many um, different properties as we like. And all you have to do is one, one tiny little function here and then just stick in a Lambda expression to do the job. Now this ain't perfect. I'm not, I wouldn't necessarily write sign off on this. I got further examples to give, but it's pretty good. And after you've written the first one, when you write the second one, unit test coverage actually is probably in the high 90%. So for hardly any effort, we've just saved ourselves one heck of a lot of time. Uh, moving on, another example of the exact sort of way I've used this in production, saving myself an awful lot of tedious problems that I cannot be bothered to solve. And this is one, if you work in EF, you have to do all the flipping time because EF is, uh, are we allowed to use swear words? Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> right, I'm not terribly keen on EF, but 
This is the sort of way you can deal with an awful lot of the boilerplate that we get presented with. I'm sticking my using in, I'm sticking in my where, and I am, noticed it is internal, so I'm already pre-filtering, say, the sort of hypothetical um, top secret records that you should never ever give out, that you would probably have to do aware on every single time you query this particular table. I'm doing the two array because it's a thing that you have needs or it explodes, and all the, doing the error handling, I'm doing all of it. And all I'm asking for, just one little thing, I'm asking for a query, a func that turns a queryable to a queryable. So that means all you have to do, instead of calling the thing directly, just call this, and in the middle, you stick a lambda, and then you can put all the where's and selects that you want inside there, and it will just paste it into the middle of this function and deal with all of that rubbish for you. So the amount of EF boilerplate code you have to write in your app turns into nearly nothing. And there's all sorts of imaginative things we could do to reduce the amount of code you need to write in the future. Moving on. Ah, one of my favorite subjects, Doctor Who. Best TV series in the entire world. I'm not taking any arguments. Also, Jodie Whittaker, well cool. Okay, so we've got ourselves a data set here. This is a bog standard, parse a CSV to a thing. So in my imaginary example, we've got some story data. This is the episode titles, the writer, um, how many people were watching it, blah, 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 blah. blah. We're separating fields with a comma, we're separating out um, record rows with a new line. Nothing very taxing. So once again, here's the good old fashioned way of doing it. Business logic all over the place, plenty of boilerplate code, lots of stuff, not very extendable because we'd have to write one of these for all sorts. So can I, no, it's not a video. I think this one is though. So what can we do to make this a bit more interesting? First things first, let's just take out these for loops. Honestly, having worked on this sort of stuff for a long time, I'm starting to come to the opinion that if you're using for loops, you're probably doing it the wrong way. Because link is cool. Link is awesome. Link is simple. And the lovely thing about link is you're writing it all in the order of operations that you're doing. That's a simple one. That's easy. And yet I still see the old for loop with a, with a list all over the place. So. Apologies if this stuff is old hat, but you would be surprised how often I see this stuff. But we'll move on to something more interesting in a bit. And in fact, we'll turn the whole thing into an arrow function, which, you know, I actually love arrow functions. I think they're a great practice to try wherever possible to you to make everything an arrow function because it constrains you to making sure that the function is not doing more than it needs to do. It's making sure that it generally stays fairly concise and does not an awful lot of stuff. I like that. That's a good thing to work to. I have literally written entire applications entirely in arrow functions. Can be done, believe it or not. It can look a bit strange in places, but it can be done. Now, the quick little thing, extension methods. Now, extension methods get a bad name. They do. I have worked places that have gotten rather upset with me for using extension methods, but I would argue they are fine in their place. They are fine, I think, when you use them um, in a completely generic way, in a way where you could literally drop this in any project in the entire world and it would be fine. And it would be just as useful there as here. The moment that you start putting business logic into an extension method, God help you, because that's the wrong way. That's hiding business logic away from the user, and that's not good. But this, I'd argue, is a totally valid use of an extension method, because all this is doing is taking away a tedious bit of boilerplate C-sharp and just wrapping it into something kind of a little bit more friendly. It's only a small thing, but consider this, that the team is made up of a whole load of people, and you're gonna have to have someone come in here, not you, maybe a junior member of the team, they're gonna have to read this and understand what it does quickly. They don't have the time to learn all the foibles of, say, all the options that go inside a, um, a string split, because they're not interested, it's not useful. Unless there's a problem with string split, who cares? All you need to know is that it does it. So this sort of thing, I would argue, is a great idea. Are we going to, yeah. Yeah, we're just going to split that in. And then what you end up with is something that's an awful lot more readable. And that's, again, a very simple example. I got loads of these that I write all the time. 
Tripars, there's another one. What the heck is going on with that format? A sort of tripars with the out and all the rest of it. You can actually make a one-line extension method that will mean that you never need to do all that out variabling ever again. It's dead easy. So that's already a lot friendlier. That is easier to read, and that is a good thing. Because again, I don't care how it works. I just want to know what it does. If I'm interested in how it does it, I'll drill in. If I'm not, I'll read and move on. So, we got a new requirement again from the boss. This time, he wants us to go back and parse all the data from the old stuff. So we're going back to the Christopher Eccleston series from, what was it, 2004? I can't remember. Um, and this time, though, there are some subtle differences. The fields are delimited now by semicolons. There are actually pipes in between rows. And there's a, it's a little hard to see, but there's a couple extra fields in there too. So our indexes don't quite match up field to data to position anymore. So it's only subtly different. It's still basically doing the same thing, but that is subtly different enough that we'd have to write a new one. And of course, we are going to do something very, very clever and sophisticated, and or we could just copy and paste, okay. We have clearly learned nothing from the last few slides. No, we are not going to copy and paste. Yes, you could, but then you might end up having to write hundreds of these things. I have seen interfaces with hundreds of entries for every conceivable variation on the data. It's a mess. And then, you know, you can find out uh, five years into this process that actually the guy that did, the person that did uh, like version number three way back made a mistake. Everyone else copied and pasted from that and everyone else since then has been replicating the same flipping error. Utter waste of our time. So we could do something like this again. Same sort of idea. So instead we're making a private enumerable of string arrays. So this is an array of arrays. So all we're doing is tell me what the string, which um, is the string story, the story itself, which is the splitter that will split the lines up, which is the splitter that will split the fields up, and I'll just stick those in here. Good first step. Not done yet. So then we just write two functions at the beginning, which tell it in each case. But again, we've still got the problem of um, interface creep because we're going to have to write, I might just skip the rest of this. Yeah, because yeah, we don't really want to write one of these for every single flipping case. That would be tedious. So what can we do? Let's stick that public back into a story data, and we'll stick a funk in. So our funk here says, here is the string data parsed out. You tell me how you want it to look, and you give me the funk that will convert it into data. We're getting better now. We're getting in the right track. But there's still a lot more we can do with this. Let that play out. Yeah, not bad. Mm -mm -mm. So we're looking like that now. So next, quick and dirty change that will take nearly no effort, but massively enhance the usability of this thing. If this, yeah, there we go. Make it generic, why not? Now. It's only a tiny, tiny, tiny change, but that has significantly altered the whole nature of this function because now this thing will take any CSV file as a whole string. You can kill it any line splitter, any field splitter, and you can convert it to any data type. So you could easily shove this thing into an extension method and you never need to write another CSV parser again so long as you live. I'm ignoring a few complexities there involving speech marks, but let's not get bogged down. But you get the idea. Why are we solving this same problem again and again when we could just solve it once? Shove it in an extension method, forget about it ever happening again. Because it's the sort of thing we do all the time. And this is, yeah, here we go. But we want to avoid creep on the, um, on the interface. So stick in an enum. Tell it old format, new format. And then let's just tell the outside world, tell me which format I'll do the rest. How do we do that? Well, you could do it something like this, where you're creating a line splitter, which is saying, uh, the get the line splitter, so you create a switch statement for each one. So that's not bad. 
we'll have a case and a default. Give it a minute. There we go. Might speed this, put the speed up on that. So that's pretty good. Default as well. I am going to point that out. Good practice to have. This I am making an assumption here that probably everything's going to be in the Jodie Whittaker format and it's only the poor old Christopher Eccleston standing alone. So always create a default. This is giving you a whole load of functionality for nothing. This means that as you add more and more um, seasons of data, unless there is something anomalous about the format, we're always having a default. This is good. So then we split everything out into one of these. Yeah, let's just skip along there. You get the idea. Even the func. So even the get converter there. That is just a function with a split that returns one or the other of a func depending on your enumerable. Still not great. That's not bad. We could do better. For a start, we can use one of, oops, what the heck did that do? Okie dokie, temperamental. Right, we can use one of my absolute favorite structures in the whole of flipping C-sharp, a dictionary. Love dictionaries, they are the best. Very efficient for lookups for a start from a performance perspective. In addition to that, they're really elegant to use. They've got that lovely, you know, um, just stick the uh, key in a bracket there. And these things are much more powerful than most people have any conception of. I mean, 99% of the times I ever see one of these things is just an enum as a key, but actually you can use anything as a key, pretty much. You could use a type as a key, and I've done some pretty extraordinary things with that. The, you can return funks out of it. You don't have to just return strings or classes or whatever. You can do an awful lot of very amazing things with these, but it has a quite significant, um, are we going to, yes, it has quite a significant limitation. And that is that it has no default. It will explode if you try and get something out of it. So I am going to solve that problem. I'm going to give dictionary a default like this. There we go. This is an extension method because like I said, extension methods are cool. So it's a function that is going to convert a dictionary into a lookup function with a default value. So what's our parameters? Well, first off, of course, coming in, we've got the actual dictionary that we're going to operate on. It's disappeared off the screen there a little bit. Our default value that we're going to return. And then x goes, this is actually returning a func. So this is a func returning another func, as it were. This is a func, this is a function that's generating another function. And we're going to say, if the dictionary contains the key, then return it, otherwise the default. And that actually returns as a function. So there you go, dictionary's now got a default. So I can actually completely delete one row out of the dictionary, stick in the default there, and now if it turns out that like flipping seasons two to 10, I think it would be, have all got the Jodie Whittaker format, we don't actually need to make any changes at all and we can continue using our dictionary, easy peasy. And then, are we, oh yes, and then, but it's a little bit inefficient because we're having to do multiple lookups to the same dictionary in that same class, which is a little bit messy. So I'm going to use one of my favorite extensions that I use all the time, Map. Map is one of those little tools that you never know you needed until you started using it. Think of this as being like a select, except it operates on the entire object at once. So instead of operating on each element, it operates on the whole thing, the whole list at once or the whole object at once and converts it from one to the other. Other than that, it's the same as a select. So I am going to use it effectively to make a call to my dictionary and then cache it inside the map function. Kind of, and then we can just, so we do our splitter lookup and then map it so the X there equals whatever came out of the dictionary. And then we can just reference it through the X. So this means that technically in one line of code, we've done all of the same functionality as that previous gigantic mess and it's one slightly funky long line in fairness. We're doing one single lookup to the dictionary and then caching it into the map function and then calling a parse with what came out of it. So all of that ooh, uh, would mean that, oops, oh dear. Sorry, there we go. 
So this thing is really, really extendable. We can quite easily drop new methods in. If it turns out like series three had some random format, one line on the dictionary at the top, jobs are good, never need to worry again. This is ridiculously easy to extend and it's not cost us an awful lot of effort. Effort. I'm using techniques that have been available pretty much since about C-sharp four, I think, with the exception of I did use a tuple in there, but there are, you could get around that with a bit of C, with a new class or something. I just find tuples nice and neat, that's all. So, moving on. Oh. Oh. Wait, is this the same one again? I think it is. Okay. Sorry, I can't see it very well from here because of the way this works. Okay, so another bit, another function, another example. This guy is another example of the structure getting in the way of the meaning. So the meaning here is a validator. We've got ourselves uh, a list of rules. This is actually Microsoft's recommended rules for um, validating a password as it happens. So it's like a list of what constitutes a valid password. Now, that's the meaning of the function, and the rules are what's important, but the structure is this if, check a thing, return false early, and then do another exactly the same. If, check the rule, return false early if it's true, and then finally at the end we've got the return true. That's the structure, that's getting in the way of easily seeing what the rules are for a valid password. So if there was a problem and someone said There's, the passwords aren't validating quite right, it would take you a bit longer to read this and understand it. If you wanted to extend this out, you'd have to do some copy pasting and all the sorts of things I don't care to do. So how can we make this look a little bit more concise? Rather like this. Another little extension method, again, totally generic, so you could just drop this in anywhere. Contains range. So this is first off, I am just taking away some of the boilerplate. This is the regex, I'm taking that away. We've got an awful lot of repetition. This is my principle that I work to. Whenever I see repetition, I get rid of it. And that regex is too much repetition, it's getting in the way of understanding what we're doing. And if at a later point we, find, uh, we find a better way of doing it than regex, well, bang, just replace it inside the um, extension method and then the whole application benefits. Easy peasy. And then let's skip on a little bit. There we go. And here's the clever bit. So, we'll create an I enumerable of funks, because that's the thing you can do. Again, surprised how many few people actually do this sort of stuff, but there we go. So this is a enumerable of funk of string to bool. That is, give me a string, I'll tell you if it's valid or not. So the string is the password, the bool is whether it's valid. And each one of these is gonna be a lambda expression, which is gonna tell you whether this password passes muster or not. So we can just copy and paste these one at a time. Are we, yep, there we go nice and compact, so one consequence immediately. We now have all of the rules listed, one after the other, quite easy to read, quite easy to understand. So you could actually show this bit of code to your boss. Now he, wouldn't necessarily, he or she wouldn't necessarily be able to replicate it, but he or she might well be able to understand it just by reading it, which is great. This is a good thing, get rid of all that junk, but how do we actually apply it? Arrow function, told you, that's the way forward, man. Call this with an all. There we go. So an all, this is link. This is just good old fashioned link. So what this all is doing is calling each function in turn and then feeding the password into it. Now an all means evaluate each expression one after the other, and if they all return true, then we return true in its entirety. If a single one of them returns false, cancel out early and return false. So every single bit of functionality of that giant function that you saw at the beginning is now replicated in these few lines of code, which are infinitely easier to read. Easy. And if you wanted to, you could take this a little bit further because that's the sort of thing I like to do when I get bored. I like to find a way to delete lines of code because come on, it's a bit cathartic in it. 
Um, you could easily write a function which would, uh, as this, okay, I think it's just, you, know, just, you could write a contains really, ah, there we go, that's the stuff. So we could easily create a contains range function at the top there, which is just generating a regex for each, you know, a call for each one, which would mean you could delete out the, um, all those X arrows in the apply validation rules function, easy. And make a, an extension method to do the apply validation rules, yeah. So another sort of a thing that you can do. This is the sort of thing that you might have to do here and there. So we are told that there's a particular item in our array that we need to replace. So this is an enumerable because if you're being a good boy then you or girl, then you are um, running everything as enumerables, which means it hasn't actually evaluated yet because that means you get loads, lazy loading included for free, which is great. But in order to replace a position, we've actually got to force a two array, evaluate the whole array out, replace our item, and then return the array, which has now been evaluated. And if we want to do this multiple times, then we're going to have to iterate the entire array several times. This is a huge waste of computer effort. It's a huge waste of our effort. So what can we do with this sucker? Uh, uh, uh. There. So extension method. Stick in an enumerable of T, call it adjust. I took the name from RamdaJS, which is one of my favorite things. Uh, that's a talk for another day. And I am extending out enumerable, and I am asking for a func T and int to bool. So T is whatever the item is, int is the position within the array, bool is should I replace it or no. So then I can do a select. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but select does have an, uh, an, over, uh, an operator overload. That is, it's not just X, but also the position within the array. Uh, so what I have done is I'm using that select. I'm using that select. I am saying pass in the object and the I from the select when I run it into the function I've been provided with. And if that returns true, return the replacement, otherwise return the object. Look, now, because I've done this as a select, I'm returning an enumerable from an enumerable. This still has not actually evaluated at the point that you called the original adjust function. This function you see here will only be called when you um, actually loop through the array itself, the base array, the original one. So this is kind of like a filter sitting in front of your enumerable, which will step in and do a replacement when needed. So. How would you actually call it? Uh, you've got two different ways of calling it. You can do an adjustment by position. So I'm saying that if i is 2, then replace with a z. I'm not going to bother actually executing this code. I'm just demonstrating it. Or you could. So that's pretty good. That's not bad. We could do a little bit better, though. That's still a lot of boilerplate. because. The position replace still needs to include the object reference. The object value um, compare still needs to include details of the index more than I'm interested in writing. So I would rewrite it something like this. I create a new class called adjust selector. So this is of T. I'm making an internal um, constructor because I don't want anyone else to ever make one of these. This is only going to be available to my adjust extension method. And I don't want anyone except for the adjust extension method to ever be able to create one of these. And the only purpose of these things is just to return out these two functions by position and by property. And the only purpose of these is effectively to take away a little bit of detail that you might not care about when you're working in production. If you're doing a whole load of replacing based on position within the array, you simply don't have to care anymore about um, what the details of the object are. If you're going to do a whole load of stuff about the details of the object but don't care about the position, again, it's just hiding detail you don't need to care about. It's characters I don't need to write. It's logic I don't need to care about. So it makes it easier for someone picking up this code who's never seen it before to maintain it. If they really care about understanding it, they can drill in. But I would argue that most of the time, we simply don't. Nobody can contain the whole of the code base in their head. You'd go insane. 
Easy peasy. So the adjust takes a function, which returns a new adjust selector, and then asks you to turn that adjust selector into a selection. And each of those two functions that come off it generate a func, which we can then feed into our adjust. So it looks kind of like that. Not bad. Now, I mean, the by property is probably a little bit excessive for just replacing strings, but let's imagine that was a complex object. You could do all sorts of fun with that. Ah, good old classic. Here we go. We've got multiple uh, implementations of the same calc uh, uh, calculate interest interface. We've got our normal interest, our advanced interest, our business interest, and our dodgy interest. Now, I'd normally make some sort of political comment and pick on someone in the news that's being annoying right now, but God, take your pick. God, I give up. So I have literally seen stuff like this. And that's that we've got an enum which tells us all the kinds of interest calculator out there. And then for each one of these, we're having someone return the correct instantiation. I have seen instances of this that ran to over 100 um, enumerate, en enum members with 100 types instantiated within it. It was ridiculous. Why are we bothering to write? Actually, come to think of it, I can probably just... I'll get there. I don't think there's any videos anymore. Yeah! Right. So, why would we bother to write out all this boilerplate? That is an awful lot of extra code we need to write. That's a lot of stuff we're going to have to search through. This method does not scale up. I'd rather just solve the problem once and never need to touch it again. That is why I would do something like this. Now, this is another thing that gets a little bit of a bad rep sometimes. This is reflection. Problems with it. It's not necessarily as efficient as non-reflected code, but most of the time, honestly, who cares? Because unless the whole, whole uh, thrust of your business is that everything must run faster as possible, probably don't want to use this. If that's not the case, if like most businesses, you just want to get the work out of the door as fast as possible, then this is perhaps more the method you want to look at. Of course, this also comes with the warning that we're operating outside of the safety barriers of um, the strongly typed C-sharp code. So all sorts of extraordinary things can happen if you're not aware of the magic, because basically it's magic. So this is the simplest example I can possibly think of. And this is doing a get type on the type, which is an enum, and literally pulling out that string. Actually, I think I can replace that with a name of these days. And then sticking interest calculator on the end, and then just literally saying C sharp, go find me a class with that name and make one. So that completely replicates all of the functionality on the previous slide. I'll probably never need to, aside from maybe adding a new item to the enum and creating a new class, I'll never need to touch this. This is all handled for me and never needs to be updated again excepting it has a few limitations. How can we resolve those? For a start, it's entirely possible it could go and fetch um, a class from the entirely wrong namespace. We can address that quite easily. I'm starting with my type. I'm saying to actually go and get all of the, assembly, the uh, types from this current assembly, get all of them, do a first or default where the type is actually possible to turn into an I calculate interest and the name equals this. So that's saving me from accidentally instantiating the wrong class that happens to have a matching name. Okie dokie, nearly done. And returning it, easy. Can still make this a bit safer though. So this is another possibility of something that might be asked for. So in our uh, dodgy interest calculator, we have got a I corrupt public figures interface that's required. So all of the previous items expected that there was simply like an anonymous constructor that could be called, but now nah, there isn't. So what can we do? How can we get our, again, I'm not going to name any particular names, because like I said, take your pick. So how can we actually instantiate something like this? It's not actually all that difficult. So. The first bit of code is exactly the same. We're getting out our type. So now having gotten the type, I'm going to get the constructors. So here I'm assuming there's a single constructor just for the sake of uh, not bogging this code sample down too much. But it wouldn't take an awful lot of effort to select out the particular constructor that you want. And from that, I am getting all the parameters and then I'm doing a select, which is converting the parameters from a type into using a function that uses some sort of magic that I don't really care about at the moment to say convert type into an actual object. 
So I've just made myself in a few lines of code, both an MVC style code router and I have made myself a dependency injection and it's dead easy. And think about this, how much code would this take to write longhand as it were? Now, for just a couple of classes, not much, but think in terms of scale. As we add tens and hundreds of classes into this structure, how much code would we have to write to accommodate all of this? When, again, we could just solve the problem once and then never worry again. Are we, what are we doing here? Oh my goodness, have we got an actual video again? How about that? No? No, no, no. That's the end. Any questions, anybody? Stunned silence. <laughs> Anyone? Okie dokie. Thank you very much, then.